Okay. So this will be our November meeting, and today's topic is going to be communication in organic synthesis, and it will be led by Dr. Matthew Horwitz. And first of all, a little background about Dr. Horwitz. I have taken his YouTube channel right here, but that's how I found about him. <laughs> so in my free time, <laughs> I'd be looking at organic chemistry videos, and somehow this new channel started, I think, six months ago or recently, and all the content was very up to the point. Like, he would do review articles, he would go over name reactions. So it was very helpful for me. And I also found out that the way he was communicating organic chemistry in these all of his videos, they were very concise. Most of the meetings lasted, or most of the uh, YouTube videos lasted like 10 minutes or 8 minutes. And it would be up to the point. So you are not losing track of things, but also in that same time, things are being delivered. So last time, last month, the idea came to me, why not just invite him to one of our meetings? And that's why I contacted him. He is right now a postdoc at Oxford University at the Wardner Group, yep. if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And uh, he'll be talking about how to communicate in chemistry, and particularly organic chemistry, because I think everything is virtual right now. This is highly important. Most of the students have to present. So we'll go ahead and get started there. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much um, for joining tonight, and thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm very excited to have the opportunity, um, especially as this is a student-invited talk. Um, so that means a lot to me. Um, today will be a part of the Synthesis Workshop uh, video podcast. So today's talk will figure into the Culture of Chemistry episodes. And um, before we get into uh, the main um, things I want to talk about today, I want to introduce myself uh, just very briefly. Um, so as Priyanth said, um, my name is Matt Horowitz. I did a PhD in the group of Jeff Johnson at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, that was focused on um, organocatalysis and total synthesis. Um, after finishing up there, I did a one-year postdoc um, in the group of Paolo Mefiore in ICIQ in Tarragona, Spain, um, working in uh, synthetic photochemistry. And um, since then, I've been working in the Gouverneur group at Oxford, um, and that's also been a really nice transition to be able to make. So outside of chemistry um, or outside of lab work, um, I've been focusing on two side projects, um, which have mainly started during the pandemic. And these are based on two observations. The first observation is that um, no one really has enough time to be reading all the papers that we'd like to be reading. And as a result, um, it's very difficult to stay up to date and at the same time manage our own careers and uh, do our own research. Um, so to deal with that, um, I've created the Synthesis Workshop video podcast. Um, which is focused on advances in synthetic organic chemistry and hopefully eventually um, arriving at a point where um, chemists can present their own work in open access videos. Um, the second side project I've been working on is based on the observation that one of the most important pieces of data for chemists, which is thin layer chromatography data, is often being underexploited or just simply lost in the process of publication. And to deal with that issue, um, I've been focusing on um, working with my brother to develop an app called Splotch, which is for saving and sharing and eventually annotating and publishing thin layer chromatography data. The main thing I wanted to speak to you about today in the context of communication and organic synthesis um, can kind of be divided into these sort of areas, graphics, language, and the organization of data and uh, research talks. So first I want to talk about um, the area of graphics in the context of organic synthesis. So um, this is an example of a natural product, um, not, not one that I've worked on, but one that I uh, made a presentation for synthesis workshop on called teletisamine. That is a, uh, a molecule that was accessed through a total synthesis by the Inoue group. And uh, this is a really complicated natural product. And when we think about how to present molecules in uh, organic synthesis, it's important to start from a good uh, template. And all the drawings I'll show you have been made with ChemDraw. Even with that said, there are ways to take advantage of ChemDraw using templates. For example, if we start by going in ChemDraw to File and Apply Document Settings, and we click on ACS Document 1996, this is a pretty nice template just to step it up already, and this is already looking a lot more attractive. If we want to think about how to make that even better looking, this is an example of the sort of template that I like to use on Synthesis Workshop. And if you want to make a graphic that looks like this, we can start by going in ChemDraw to File and Document Settings, 
and we'll select that and this generates a list of categories. From that list we'll select drawing and here what's important is to fix these um, bond lengths and widths so that they match these values here. So with that then we can generate the custom template that's used in Synthesis Workshop. And then just as a final touch I think it's a good idea to also make sure that our text size and font matches the Helvetica 14 um, to make it look like this. Once we've got our template ready to go, we can start to think about how to put together a reaction scheme. For example, this is one that was used in the Synthesis Workshop episode. Um, that's a Grignard reaction, so this is the addition of methyl magnesium chloride to a ketone. And when we think about how to put together this graphic, some things that we'll notice are that it's important to align the reagents and solvents and reaction outcome over the arrow. And this gives it a really nice, aesthetically pleasing look to it. Once we've got a single reaction, we can start to line up different reactions in the sequence. For example, there's an oxidative transposition that was used in this reaction sequence using PCC. So moving forward from here, to make this sequence, we can see that it, it looks very nice if we were able to line up the arrows, the reaction outcomes, and the intermediates and starting materials uh, involved. So that really starts to make it look a, a little bit more professional, I think. Um, by putting the references out of the way, but in a clear location. Um, this also allows the audience to pay greater attention to the important material that's on the slide. Here's another example of a um, reaction sequence that starts from an acetylation of proline. So in this first step, the authors of this paper treated proline with acetic anhydride and arrived at this intermediate. In the second step, um, this involved a significantly larger cocktail of reagents in order to functionalize the carboxylic acid as a Weiner bamid. And here, um, this used these two reagents um, in the second step. And um, this arrives at a problem that we often see in organic synthesis presentations, which is the kind of alphabet soup of uh, reagents that can be difficult to read and digest and start to think about what's actually happening in the reaction, what's being activated, and um, what, what are these reagents actually doing? And uh, for this reason, I think it's a pretty good idea to also um, put up uh, boxes or some kind of label um, showing what those um, letters mean. Um, it can be useful to put the abbreviation next to the full name as well as um, potentially any nicknames um, or common names that those molecules might have. Um, so when we're doing that, we wanna be introducing those new reagents as they come up in the sequence. Here's an example of a mechanism slide, and this is an example from the Inouye group where they start by taking a secondary alkyl triflate, and they use this as a precursor for a um, secondary carbocation, which can be generated with these conditions using a lot of heat. And that can undergo a subsequent wagner meerwein rearrangement in order to generate a tertiary carbocation in this structure which then um, can be attacked at the allylic position by dimethyl sulfoxide as the solvent. And that can generate this type of intermediate, which can then undergo a sworn type oxidation in order to generate an enone in this product. So using this kind of mechanism, the authors in this paper, they were able to set up the BCD ring system in this product. So some things that are um, important, I think, to note about making a slide that looks like this so we're introducing small number of steps at one time. We're also using precise hand-drawn arrows in order to make this as um, accurate as possible. Um, for example, in these bond migrations um, and this nucleophilic attack, um, it's, it's a lot uh, nicer to look at if we have hand-drawn arrows than the um, archetypal arrows if we click on this button below it. It's also nice in polycyclic systems to use ring fill colors. That makes it a bit more visually appealing to see the ring systems that have formed. And finally, in a mechanism that involves rearrangements, I think it's also nice to use colored circles in the background of the atoms in order to make it kind of more visually easy for the viewer to see which atom is becoming which atom in the product. So it's a bit easier to follow, I think. Thinking about retrosynthesis a little bit, there are a couple of different ways that people like to use to show that. One way that I like to use is by using the contrast of a bold line and a dotted line using a bold line as a disconnection and a dotted line to connect it to the text that's describing that type of disconnection. So for example, in this case on the left, we've got two lines showing um, the disconnections that would be used in a Prinz annulation, or in this case on the right, we've got a disconnection for an esterification. Um, here's some other examples of different times that we've used this sort of style for um, doing retrosynthesis 
Um, here are some other examples with, uh, for example, this one disconnection for the a Mitsunobu reaction or two disconnections that are being um, made at the same time in the process of a 3 plus 2 that was proposed. Um, we could also think about using these hand-drawn arrows with an arrow at one side um, to um, kind of precisely show a retrosynthetic operation that we would need to do um, at a very specific site in a molecule um, in a retrosynthetic sense. Um, or alternatively, we can also think about using uh, these circles behind the drawing in order to show atoms that would need to be reconnected in a retrosynthetic sense. Um, so that's also, I think, a pretty appealing way to show a retrosynthetic operation. So that kind of closes up the things I wanted to say about graphics. Talking about the language of organic synthesis a little bit more, um, this is something I didn't really become aware of until I started the PhD. And during that process in my first year, then I started to hear a lot of words, um, some including these on the right, um, that were very un unfamiliar. And it was not really clear which um, was the correct context to use these words in, um, if I knew any of them at all. Um, but what I kind of realized through my graduate school experience is that by having conversations with the other people in the group, then you start to build up a level of familiarity with the kind of vocabulary that you're expected to know. Those conversations can also be with the supervisor as well as other, you know, visiting academics. And that, you know, provides you a kind of training with, um, you know, what the level of proficiency uh, in the vocabulary and concepts um, is expected of, uh, the, of you at the doctoral level. Looking at papers, this is also an important way for getting involved in the community and learning uh, the language of organic synthesis, particularly outside of the scope of your research group. Because within a research group, we have a tendency to call things by, in a certain way. And also, we have a tendency to limit ourselves to a particular scope of the field. But of course, reading papers pushes us outside of that scope within a research group. Um, and then, of course, it's also important to think about how to watch presentations by visiting uh, researchers, uh, either in the academic sector or in the industrial sector, in order to really um, broaden the range of um, vocabulary and concepts that we're comfortable talking about and uh, dealing with. And through that kind of process, then we start to build up that vocabulary and that conceptual development to the point that we're comfortable um, with all the terms and all the ideas that were, are, that really form a central part of our doctoral education. And through that process, then we start to be able to think about um, how to explain reaction outcomes, either to our peers or to our supervisors. We think about how to discuss our new ideas with our supervisor or our peers, how to think about the feasibility of an idea and talk about that using the vocabulary and concepts that we've developed during our graduate education, and eventually how to teach those ideas to someone that's going through the same things that we've just gone through. Um, so this is all kind of a cyclic process. And then it's also important to think about the um, target audience that we're trying to reach. For example, if we're reaching out to our parents and friends, the conversation is going to be very different than if we're talking to um, a student of organic chemistry, which in turn would also be very different than if we're speaking to a lab mate or a supervisor. For example, if we're speaking to our friends or um, family or just members of the general public, our aim, of course, is to use common and relatable terms so we don't risk alienating um, the audience, for example, by using the, the kind of stereotypical uh, overcomplicated jargon. When we speak to students, then we're principally thinking about how to introduce the new terms and explain them and relate them to one another um, in a way that's going to allow them to enter into a more technical environment. In the case of a lab mate or supervisor, we're thinking about um, how to use those terms correctly and how to increase our usage of those terms to the point that it demonstrates that proficiency um, at the doctoral level. You might be giving the following statement to a member of the public. Um, if we were describing something that happened in one of our publications, you could be saying there's a lot more of one mirror image of the molecule than the other. And this is describing a particular situation in organic synthesis, which if we were describing to a student, it might be more technically accurate to say there's an enantiomeric excess of 90%, uh, meaning there's a 95 to 5 enantiomeric ratio. And here, this is important because now we're introducing the technical terms and we're also relating them to one another. Um, so the student's becoming more um, comfortable using those terms. Um, whereas if we're interacting with a lab mate or supervisor, we want to save time and we also want to demonstrate that proficiency. So we'll say it's 90% EE and that's the end of the story.
Um, the challenge, of course, when we're interacting with parents and friends is that sometimes it's difficult to find a relatable way um, to connect a complex idea to a common idea. Um, it can be difficult to explain an anti-selectivity to someone who's never thought about chirality before. So these are the sorts of issues that we have to think about when we're talking to members of the public, um, which is also an issue when we're thinking about how to apply for funding. When we're working with students, often the challenge is just maintaining that awareness of what vocabulary we're using as we're using it. Because oftentimes when we start to use this complicated jargon, then um, we're not aware of what we're saying anymore. Um, for example, using the term an antimeric excess or an antimeric ratio, um, these are things that the first time we use them with a student, we have to slow down and explain them. And conversely, when we're speaking to a lab mate or supervisor, then we've got to make sure that we're um, using those terms correctly and that, um, we're, that we've developed our vocabulary and, and, um, and our conceptual background to the point that we're understanding what, what those terms mean as, as we use them. Um, so that's just kind of a, a brief primer on um, language and organic chemistry. And then finally, um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, organization in the context of um, communication and organic synthesis. And thinking about just the way that people like to organize talks, um, some people like to use this sort of style on the left, the text overview, and some people like to use this style on the right, the graphical overview. Um, those are both fine, but one thing I think is nice to transition from this uh, overview to a more focused view is the fade from uh, all colored or all black to gray. And that, that's a nice transition that kind of lets the audience focus on uh, one of the um, themes. For example, this first theme that we want to talk about. Thinking about how to give a summary of your own work is also a really important aspect of organization. This is an example of how I like to summarize um, one period of my own work. And this could be useful um, during job interviews or um, research proposals um, or any number of other applications. So let me give you an example of how I'd like to present this. So in this first project, um, this is my first paper, which was a three-component reductive coupling between isotins, aryl aldehydes, and dialkyl phosphates. This proceeds under the um, catalytic action of a triamino iminophosphorane organocatalyst and delivers these functionalized products that have two adjacent stereocenters with orthogonally protected alcohols. Uh, while the initial limitation of this methodology was um, the requirement that we had to use an isotin, we were eventually able to expand this methodology to include benzylidine pyruvates as potential coupling partners. And while this was successful in the end, it did require um, the identification of a different catalyst class um, in order to get this reaction to work in an asymmetric sense. In the second case, we were using um, triaryl iminophosphorane organocatalyst developed by the Dixon group um, in Oxford. So once we've introduced the two topics that we want to talk about in our research summary, then we'll transition into a more focused view and try and think about what connects them. So if I was presenting this at an interview or, at, uh, or in a research talk, I'd be thinking about how to connect them by saying, and now we'll go into this more deeply, we'll take a closer look. Um, adding this bold border is a little bit uh, is a nice touch, I think, to emphasize that. And then we'll talk about what connects them. We'll give the research background. So when we think about how to connect um, carbonyl reaction partners, which is what we're doing in both of these projects, when we think about how to do that um, in a classical sense, then normally the um, reaction manifold we think about is a ketial radical coupling mechanism, where we're generating two radicals that are being coupled in order to form this cross-coupled product. And then when we present this, we want to think about how to present the challenges first. Um, so the challenges that I would identify if I was presenting this would be um, the problem of homo versus cross-coupling, the problem of stereoselectivity, and the problem of how to differentiate the alcohols formed in this product um, in downstream transformations. Um, and then once we've introduced the, the problems or the challenges, then go into um, our approach, how, it may, how our approach is different from the traditional approach. So this is the approach that's being used in both of these projects, where we're using a carbanion or an enolate equivalent um, in combination with an appropriate electrophile um, to form the same type of bond. So this is a two electron mechanism, um, which is trying to replace this uh, one electron mechanism. Um, but this is just kind of a conceptual overview. To get to the more specific mechanism, then we go through um, how the catalytic cycle works. So let me give you an example of that. So we can start from the top of the catalytic cycle, focusing on um, this Bronsted-based catalyst B, 
which is going to be deprotonating the dialkyl phosphate in order to generate the dialkoxyphosphate um, nucleophile. That can then engage in a nucleophilic attack called a Padovic addition, followed by a phosphobrook rearrangement um, in order to generate a carbanion or enolate. Um, and depending on the audience, we would want to decide whether or not to show all of those steps or just leave it as uh, that quick summary. And then um, we can do a addition of that enolate into the second carbonyl reaction partner to form a carbon-carbon bond and define two stereocenters. Then, depending on the steric nature of the um, red and blue versus the green and yellow substituents, it's possible to have a dioxyphosphenyl migration um, to place the phosphate on the less hindered of the two potential alkoxides. Um, then finally, a proton transfer generates the product and regenerates the catalyst. So uh, what we've done so far is given the um, walkthrough of the project, given the challenges and what our solution is, given a very specific catalytic cycle, and then quickly showing um, some potential products or um, products that we formed in, the, in one of these projects. When we give a talk about total synthesis, um, rather than methodologies, um, there are often other challenges. Um, this is a slide from a, a total synthesis talk about a total synthesis by the Baron group on this molecule maximycin. Um, I think it's a good idea when we do total synthesis talks to um, start by introducing the biological activity and some of the history um, so that's what this first statement is doing. Um, it's also important, of course, to show the structure of um, what the total synthesis is aiming to make and um, any important notes about that structure. And then, um, having introduced the target a little bit, we want to give a kind of abbreviated um, retrosynthesis. So we want to show the, a um, simplified retrosynthesis aiming to disconnect that into simpler components. And then, to kind of justify that retrosynthesis um, I think it's a good idea to show some of the concepts that underlie um, those disconnections. So what reactions are necessary to make those disconnections happen? And um, this is one example of how um, I think it's a nice idea to show that in kind of cartoon form, um, where we're just focusing on one part of the molecule at a time. We're showing the action that's happening um, with precise hand-drawn arrows um, and colors that contrast the background. And we're going through those and explaining how um, each fragment needs to be made to justify the disconnection we talked about before. And as we're going through those tactics, we're also cycling um, appropriate references through on the bottom. So um, and that's, in that way, we're able to kind of use the, um, the cartoons of the tactics to kind of explain the broader synthetic plan of the synthesis, if that makes sense. Um, one of the more important aspects of giving a um, presentation in organic synthesis is the table, um, which is a, something that's difficult to get right, um, but very easy to get wrong. Um, here's an example of a reaction going from A to B using two reagents, one and two. I think that the key with the table is uh, to um, only in introduce what's necessary and to go a few entries at a time and uh, to point out what the major conclusions are. So for example, if we start from this top entry, um, all we're doing in this entry between one and two is determining whether or not reagent one is necessary. And based on the result, it looks like that is pretty necessary. It, it is pretty critical um, for the success of the reaction. So with that, we would make some note uh, off to the side um, explaining um, that that is necessary. Um, and then, of course, for um, completeness, we'd also want to show um, whether or not reagent two is necessary. It looks like that's not um, quite as critical as uh, reagent one, but it, it still has some uh, marginal benefit on the reactivity. Um, and then we'd want to so show another um, background reaction to see what happens without reagent one or reagent two, and we saw that there's no yield. Um, then we can just make a note saying no background reaction. Um, and a, a counterexample for what not to do is something like this, where we've got two different shades of gray, um, a bunch of entries where it's not clear what the relationship between any two entries is. You, you, you laugh now, but I think that you actually will see many, many tables in your career that look very much like this. Um, so some, some uh, more specific aspects of this, I mean, we've got solvents that are changing almost every line. Um, it's difficult to tell what the difference um, between um, one equivalent and 0.7 equivalents of reagent two is because the solvent's not quite the same. So it's hard to draw any meaningful conclusions um, from a table like this. And additionally, it, everything was up there at once. So, you know, your eyes are already trying to draw conclusions, but the speaker hasn't made it easy for us.
So that's just a little bit about tables. And finally, um, the last thing I wanted to say about organization is in the area of um, summarizing methodologies, either your own methodologies or methodologies of someone else's work. Um, so this is an example of a methodology summary I put together for um, one episode um, about the birch reduction. And uh, the idea of uh, this methodology is to difunctionalize an alkene using a 1,4-cyclohexadiene uh, reagent. And um, this is the general strategy, but the way that this has been implemented um, we'll give examples of as we go through. So in this first iteration, then um, this is a hydrocyanation where um, the authors are using a 1,4-cyclohexadiene bearing a hydrogen and a cyanide to do that transformation to difunctionalize um, the alkene. Um, some other examples of how this um, general strategy was applied to difunctionalization are in hydromethylation of alkenes, as well as hydroiodination of alkynes. And here, the emphasis that we're um, placing is on the, um, the substituents that are being added in the difunctionalization to the alkene, which we're doing um, using the colored balls, which it makes it just a little bit easier um, for the audience to trace out how exactly those components are um, getting added to the alkene. Um, that way they're not getting so tied down in which specific byproduct is being formed, which specific catalyst is being used in each case. Once we've shown the idea in an abstract sense, then we can zone in on one particular case. For example, the hydrocyanation, and we can explain how is this working in that case. So we can explain that by saying that the boron trichloride is abstracting the cyanide in order to generate the cyclohexadienyl carbocation, and um, that can behave as an acid in the presence of an alkene in order to protonate the alkene and generate a carbocation, as well as uh, this aromatic byproduct. Then the carbocation can be trapped um, by the cyanide bearing species in order to generate the difunctionalized product and regenerate the catalyst. So with that, we can kind of start from the, gen the general strategy, show the iterations, and then zero in on one of them to explain how it works um, so that the audience is more familiar with that um, and gets a broader feeling for the scope of the methodology. Um, so those are the main things I wanted to talk about in graphics, language, and organization in the context of communication and organic synthesis. That's all I have for you today, um, but feel free to reach out to me uh, um, either by email um, or whichever means you prefer. Thank you for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, please support us by liking and subscribing, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.